start our service today. Welcome. Good morning. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see those of you that are here in person. And I know that we have our watching either later today or later in the week. And please know that you are part of our worship today. Um, we've got some intimation to share just before we begin our service. The first is that there'll be tea or coffee afterwards at North Hall, just up the road. And um, they're looking for a few volunteers. Um, anyone might be able to help with that. Serving teas and coffees. And also volunteers for reading lessons on a Sunday morning, particularly for Communion Sunday on the 5th of November. So just have a wee think if that's something that you think you might be able to help with. The Shoebox Appeal. You're invited to support the Shoebox Appeal this year. Mary Livingston and Rebecca Wallace are coordinating this and there'll be boxes available, I think there was some of you before and certainly afterwards at the back of the church. The guild, the next meeting is of this Thursday, 7 pm, in the South Halls, the speaker is Ivan Ruddock. The subject is the Garden Festival from 1988. I remember that fondly. I was always too scared to go on the big roller coaster. <laughs> But I remember it well, uh, so that was really be interesting. Crossreach orders for 20, 24 calendars are now being taken, and Margaret Berniston will take those for you for five pounds each. On 29th of October, there'll be a caring for creation service, uh, which will be about the world God created for us and the battle that we all face against the effects of climate change. Um, think about that. You might have planted some wildflower seeds which we gave out in the spring and we'd love to see the dogs if you have any photos of them. They were a notice board and you can pin them up on Sunday 29th, that's next Sunday. The early fellowship meetings will take place this week on Tuesday and Thursday as usual. Uh, Thursday morning will be Zoomed from the chapel in the South Hall. Um, you'll be able to join us Join myself and John will be there on Thursday morning as well at 9.30. The coffee shop reopens this Tuesday at 10 a.m. and then it'll be open again on Wednesday and Thursday, 10 to 12, and then uh, sorry, 10 to 2, and then Friday, 10 to 12. And there's a pastoral care book which is available for names of anyone who you think might benefit from a, from a visit. It will be positioned just outside the restaurant your door and you can contact the minister, Pat Marwick or Janet Johnson, if there's someone that you think might benefit from that. The food bank, if you want to donate to the local food bank, you can bring donations of food right here to the church. Winter warmth, the first session is on Friday the 3rd of November, 1.30 till 3.30 in the South Hall Coffee Shop. Please come and enjoy the warmth and fellowship as well as games, quizzes, tea and coffee. And that's a great opportunity to invite somebody to come along to something. It's a soft entry and it's a chance to let them know that we're not as weird as they might think. Or maybe we are. Maybe we're weird now. Um, first Monday meets on Monday the 6th in Carrer North Hall from 1.30 to 3.30. The speaker is Trisha and she'll be updating us on life on the barge and the very game of indoor curling which is suitable for all abilities. And just lastly, today at Springfield Cambridge, the Junior Chorus will be having a taster session from 12.30 till 1.30 in the choir room. Come along and join the fun boys and girls aged 7 to 14 are all welcome to come and see what it's like to sing. There's no addition required. No fee and music's going to be Friday. So that's a great chance. Um, maybe just come and see John after the service if that's something that you think might be of interest. Um, so that's the end of our notices. Let's bring ourselves before God now as we call to worship because it's been a, another devastating week in the news when we see things in Israel and Palestine that we hoped might have been behind us. I remember that time growing up and thinking that looks all very weird. And it's still there. And the news and the internet can sometimes make us feel a bit closer to it, but the reality is it's so distant for us. I know there's times this week some of us maybe were without power and water, but nobody was showering bombs on us 
It wasn't the fear, it wasn't the same thing that people are experiencing there. And our hearts can get overwhelmed if we try to deal with these things alone. But we come to God both individually and collectively, and we trust that He's working in and through these situations. And so that leads us to give thanks for the relief efforts that are starting, for the little bits of progress that are being made. And we pray that they would be resourced by the generosity of our hearts and by the equipping of God. Prophet Isaiah tells us, For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. And so with that truth in our hearts, let's lift our voices in praise as we sing, Be still for the presence of the Lord. Hymn number 189, CH4. I'm 
through the ice. A sponge. You're a bright bunch here in Canada. <laughs> a sponge, you're right. Now, get the start in a wee bit trickier, I hope. <laughs> what has many keys but can't open the door? Can't open any doors. What has many keys but can't open the door? I'll lift out to the crowd. <laughs> piano, there we go. A piano has many keys. Just a couple more. What? And this is a bit poor. This is a dad joke as well. What kind of tree can you carry in your hand? I heard a murmur out there. A palm tree. What has legs but can't walk? A wee stick. A wee stick. <laughs> what? This is kind of a phrase of the day. What has legs but can't walk? A table. Good, but a chair. That's what my son said when I tested him on Okay, one last one. What, are, what aren't you able to use until you've broken it? What? You sometimes might have it in the morning. Yes. Coffee. Kind of. You need to break it open the packet. Anyone else? What about if you were making a boiled egg or a fried egg? You need to snap you to break it on the side, don't you, before you can actually use it. Well, a little bit later on, we're going to be reading about a time when some people were asking Jesus a trick question. They were trying to trap him, catch him out, because they didn't really fancy him too much. They thought, he's getting on our nerve, we're going to trip him up. But you know what? Jesus was too wise for them. He saw through it all. Jesus instead has a question and questions for us, but they're not tricks. It's simply this, and he said it to his disciples, and he says it to us too. He says, will you follow me? Will you follow me? And what do you think that might mean, to follow Jesus? Yes, Adam. What a brilliant answer. I don't know if you heard that. Follow him in the things that he does. That's brilliant. And we find out about the things that he does. There's a big one up here. You might have a smaller one at home. In the Bible. So we learn about him. About his character. About how he was kind to people. And about the things that he did. And that is one of the ways that we can follow him. Now. People try to trick Jesus. He never, ever tries to trick us. And so we can trust him with the big things, the things that we see in the news, the things that seem a wee bit beyond us. And we can also trust him with the little things. That's what it means to follow him. So if you're having a bad day at school, or something's not quite right at home, we can say to Jesus, would you teach me what it means to follow you just now? How can I follow you when I'm having a bad day? Because he's always there for us, no matter what. So I hope you have a really good time learning this morning. Do you know what I've asked you on? If one day I could come up and just be with you and learn about what you're learning. So I'll see you hopefully before too long. Thank you for coming and taking part. Thank you for giving me your attention so well. And enjoy your time in Sunday school. We're going to sing together now. Go on, you can go and have a wee seat. See you later. Bye bye. We're going to sing hymn number 443 He is Lord.
lovely young people in your church. Some of the churches that I've been to recently in my uh, placements haven't had as many. And so it's just a great encouragement, isn't it? It brings something different to the church. It lightens it. It, uh, it just, they're, they're little shining beacons of hope. So thanks to God for that. Let's pray together now. Let's join our hearts together. <laughs> Almighty God, you are the God who seeks us, who runs out to meet us and longs to forgive. And so we turn towards you this morning and ask for forgiveness, knowing that you delight in the power of your redeeming love. We thank you that you have made a way for us to be reconciled to you, that through the work of your Son on the cross we become a new creation, no longer belonging to this world, but to your eternal promise. So would you help us to know and live that we are forgiven, and to have the freedom that goes with that, that the world no longer has claims on us. Holy Spirit, meet us here as we turn towards you with expectant minds and hopeful hearts. Help us to be transformed as we approach your word, Give us ears to hear what you are saying to us, and open the eyes of our heart. And then equip us, and enable us for the role you have given us to be ambassadors for your kingdom. Teach us what it means to be co-workers with Christ, and equip us individually and collectively for the plans you have set out. And so we say the, these prayers in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray as we say together now, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Let's sing a third hymn now, which is hymn number 111 in CH4. Holy, 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 Lord, Lord Almighty. Please stand if you're able.
Old Testament reading this morning is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 45. And you'll find this on page 709 of the Pew Bible. Reading from verse 1. The Lord has chosen Cyrus to be king. He has appointed him to conquer nations. He sends him to strip kings of their power. The Lord will open the gates of the cities for him. To Cyrus, the Lord says, I myself will prepare your way, leveling mountains and hills. I will break down brown gates and smash the iron bars. I will give you treasures from dark secret places. Then you will know that I am the Lord and that the God of Israel has called you by name. I appoint you to help my servant Israel, the people that I have chosen. I have given you great honour, although you do not know me. I am the Lord, there is no other God. I will give you the strength you need, although you do not know me. I do this so that everyone from one end of the world to the other may know that I am the Lord and that there is no other God. I create both light and darkness and bring both blessings and disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. And the New Testament reading is from Matthew. Chapter 22, reading the question about paying taxes from verse 15, and you'll find it on page 32 of the New Testament section of the Pew Bible. The Pharisees went off and made a plan to trap Jesus with questions. Then they sent him to some of it, it sent to them some of their disciples and some members of Herod's party. Teacher, they said, we know that you tell the truth. You teach the truth about God's will for people, without worrying what other people think, because you pay no attention to anyone's status. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it against our law to pay taxes to the Roman Emperor not. Jesus, however, was aware of their evil plan, and so he said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin for paying the tax. They brought him the coin, and he asked them, Whose face and name are on these? The emperors, they answered. So Jesus said to them, Well then, pay the emperor what belongs to the emperor, and pay God what belongs to God. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. Thanks be to God for these readings from his word. Father, we come to your word this morning and perhaps we think, oh, we've heard that before. Please give us fresh ears and hearts that are soft to receive what you want to say to us today and then help us to take that with us into the rest of the day and the rest of our lives that we would be changed in some way as we become sharpened to become more and more like Jesus. Amen. Over the course of a, a working career, we'll experience different leadership styles. I can recall one particular boss at a previous job who was great at identifying your strengths and encouraging you. And they say nice things about you, they made you feel good. 
and it makes you want to please them. And like all good leaders, I guess, they were also really adept at getting you to do things that you weren't quite so keen to do. And the way that this particular person used to do this is they would arrange a one-to-one meeting, maybe coffee, maybe a cake or something, and they would build me up. And in truth, what they were actually doing was building up my ego. And then, and this is the clever bit, towards the end of our time together, after building me up, they would very gently place in front of me the task that needed to be done. It was a really good tactic. Uh, I'd been made to feel so good about myself that I'd be kind of slightly off guard. I would be sitting a bit more comfortably in my seat. And therefore I would agree to something that in reality was less appealing than it was being made out to be. And I have very fond memories of that boss. We remain friends. And within the larger team, there's about 10, 12 of us, there was no animosity, but we always used to joke if someone was going into a one-to-one meeting with the boss. We'd say, don't fall for it. You know who's coming. Stay alert, particularly at the end of the meeting. But it's tough to resist when your ego is being massaged. And there's a sense in which the Pharisees are trying to butter Jesus up in that gospel passage that we've just read. And from their side, it's a tactic designed not to encourage him, but rather to trap him. Because Jesus had become a really serious problem for them. He'd been making waves, disturbing their peace, unsettling them in their position of what was self-appointed power. There's nothing particularly subtle about what Jesus has been saying to them, or rather about them. Because he'd been using parables, yes, but his audience weren't daft. They they knew fine well that he was referring to them. And so when Jesus spoke the parable of the two sons and the parable of the tenants, which precede our passage, he was plainly indicting the Jewish leaders of that time. And even in the verses that are right before us, where Jesus speaks of the wedding feast, he was condemning them as the guests who had refused the invitation. So Jesus had been on the front foot, illuminating their misplaced religious values, and he was gaining support on the ground. His following was growing. Jesus has had momentum ever since that time he'd ridden into Jerusalem on the donkey and then disrupted the temple in the most unsubtle of fashions when he flipped over the tables. But now, well now the Pharisees have had enough. How dare this upstart unsettle their power and control over religious matters and so they had to apply plan designed to lure Jesus into discrediting himself. Because if they could embarrass him, trip him up on an important matter, then they would disrupt the momentum and they could regain control over religious matters. <coughs> and so having huddled into a wee plot, uh, huddled together to plot against them, They come to him with a carefully formulated question. They don't reveal their hands straight straight away. No, the first they want to increase is self-esteem. Teacher, they said, we know you're a man of integrity. And you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. So they were appealing to Jesus' ego. The only problem with that is, he didn't have one. And so those statements that would have been a great endorsement to anyone else, they don't land on Jesus. He knows what they're up to. Because then comes the question that they have been building up to. The question designed to publicly reveal him as a fraud. They place the Roman coin in his hand and ask, 
Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And this question puts Jesus in a very real dilemma. You see, if he said it was unlawful to pay the tax, he'd be wheeled up to the Roman government officials and arrested. And if he said it was lawful to pay the tax, then the Jews would take issue with him, because to pay tax was to admit the validity of a foreign earthly king, and that was an insult to God, who was their only king. So Jesus is in trouble either way, or so it seems. Because Jesus doesn't evade the question. Rather, he calmly takes the coin, looks at it, and asks them the simple question, whose image is on the coin? Caesar's, they reply. Well then, give it back to him, it's his. And give to God what belongs to him. Now the wisdom here of Jesus is unique. So often in his teaching, he refrains from laying down specific laws and regulations, but rather he creates principles that stand the test of time. And that's why Jesus' teaching remains so absolutely relevant today. The principle that was applied to that situation in the first century is also still applicable to us and for the generations to come. And that's why some people continue to be irked by him. In our time they won't be known as Pharisees or Sadducees, but there will be groups both religious and non-religious people that want to trip Jesus up. And in his physical absence, we can often be the target of that trap. And it's us that get asked the tricky trick questions. Was Jesus real? Why do you trust the Bible? Why does God allow suffering? And right now, none more tricky than, why does God allow war? Sensitive issues, delicate issues. Some might be asked with genuine integrity and seeking clarity. Other times asked with an intention to belittle and discourage. So what are we to do then? Because we're not blessed with that inherent knowledge and wisdom that Jesus had. It doesn't trip off our tongue in the same way. Here's the thing, we have access to it. Prayerfully, it's within our grasp. Because it's within Scripture that we find our defence. The words of the Bible, the words of God, provide for us the wisdom we need to reveal our God and justify our faith. After all, it was good enough for Jesus. When he was tempted in the wilderness, he quoted scripture to the devil to correct him. He called upon the same words that are available to us. And so we can be equipped for those tricky questions when they come. Those questions that if you dig a little deeper, are actually intended to make God either irrelevant or more often just non-existent. Much of the book of Isaiah is concerned with that, ensuring that we are equipped with a correct understanding of God. Because whatever the tricky question is, and no matter how it's put to us, it'll all essentially boil down to who we consider God to be. How big he is, if we place restrictions upon him. Do we limit him in some way? Do we limit his sovereignty? Because that can happen all too easily when we're faced with a tricky question. We try and justify it as something to do with ourselves. But that passage
passage from Isaiah, and indeed the whole book of Isaiah, strives to rectify that kind of faulty understanding. In his writing, Isaiah wants to help us. Help us to accept God not as the God we expect, but as the God who, frankly, does things his own way. That's going to ruffle some feathers. Earlier in the book, we're told that that's going to happen. God will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Because his ways are not our ways. That much is evident from that first reading. When we read that God considers Cyrus to be his anointed Cyrus. Really? I mean, he's a pagan politician. And yet God is using this Gentile conqueror to bring about his purposes. It's not how we would have done it. But that's the whole point. God wants us to embrace him as God as he willingly takes responsibility for everything that happens. He makes it clear in that passage, I will go before you I will break down the gates. I will give you the treasures of darkness. Why? So that you may know that I am the Lord. And that's important because there are idols aplenty in the time of Isaiah, as there are in our own 21st century context. And God wants them and us to be absolutely clear that he is the Lord, there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. And that final verse, it says, I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity, prosperity and create disaster. It's not easy reading, is it? I, the Lord, do all these things. So God takes responsibility for it. The good and the bad. The big story of the Bible brings all of, real, all of reality, including the sufferings of life, under his command. The Bible doesn't shrink from what we might consider our problems. His strategies might not be ours, his processes might seem odd, as people that we deem unsuitable gain positions of power in the world. We've seen that recently. The truth is that God uses whatever persons and methods he wants to, whether we like it or not. And he uses them. He uses them for his redemptive purposes. So that even Cyrus is in some small way a foreshadow of the true anointed one, Jesus Christ, who comes to reconcile us to God. <coughs> If we're honest, God's approach can sometimes leave us frustrated. The gospel in some way leaves many of our urgent personal questions unanswered. When we receive bad news, when medical results aren't what we hope and pray for, those things are hard. Jesus promises to walk with us through those times of trial and suffering. But the greater, redemptive purpose of God will create bigger questions that lead us to Him. Does life have meaning? Is there more than this? Is there hope? And so when we experience see and read about bad things going on in the world, he asks us to trust him, to trust him enough not to take offence, but to continue to follow him. He accepts full responsibility. So what we see on the news, as difficult as it is to watch, God knows it. His sovereignty means that he doesn't blame someone else. I 
After all, he was the architect of the plan that placed his own son upon the cross. When we minimise God, when we make him a small God, a local God, our understanding of him will leave us unfulfilled. And the question of the Pharisees in that gospel passage regarding tax and coins, that's essentially a small one. It's a circumstantial one. Jesus was much more concerned that we would know not who the coin belonged to, but who we belong to. Give to God what is God's. So we give him our lives, warts and all. He is our God through good times and bad. We belong to him. And we give him the glory as creator, sustainer and saviour. And that allows us to have a hope and a future which is not relying on our own circumstances or those in the wider world. So we pray on. We pray on for the wee things and we pray on for the big things. Knowing and trusting that he is the Lord there is nothing that happens out with his control. Amen. We're going to sing hymn number 449. Please stay seated. We sing Rejoice, the Lord is King.
bountiful God. We thank you for what we've been able to give today, either in person or in a different way. We ask that you would take it, that you would bless it, multiply it, that you, that you would use it for your purposes, both here locally and for your wider kingdom. And as that is done, may your name be glorified. And Lord, your word has reached our ears this morning. And we pray now that your spirit would help it to dwell in our hearts and our minds. That we would trust in the hope that's laid out before us. And be people that share that hope with others. Father, we have a hope for Israel. In Palestine, we have a hope that your peace would come, that the Prince of Peace would make his presence known in a way that is unavoidable. Grant wisdom to those that consider themselves to have power. Move among them so that they choose the path of peace instead of the path of turmoil. And Father, while that particular struggle is forefront in our news, we know that there are others throughout the world that might be less newsworthy but are no less sore. And so we pray for those situations that peace may come. Father, all around us we see brokenness. People we love can be plagued by addictions and they're held in dark places. We just want to come and break those chains and release them into your care. Because we know there to be physical illness and issues of mental health. And we see the hurt that causes. We pray that people might be able to receive the care they need and that you would be at the heart of their healing process. Let them know the hope offered in Jesus and draw them very tenderly towards you. Lord, we see and experience a world where inequality is rife, where opportunities continue to be limited and there are barriers to people fulfilling their potential. As people of God, let us be attentive to times when you motivate us to be radical, to challenge when we know things are detrimental to others, and to proclaim the freedom that we have in Christ. And so we ask, that you would move us up and out of this building to take your message to the people of our communities. So create in us a boldness that is not of our own making, but rather a movement of your spirit in our lives. For we long to have your name glorified rather than vilified, to see you high and lifted up, and for people to know the peace of salvation through your Son, Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing our final hymn now. Hymn number 786. May the God of peace go with you.
Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace.